but I was only able to, to cook for three days because I ended up having a health issue. And Srila Prabhupada had, had a sign in the kitchen and it said, health is number one, chanting is number two, Serve, or service is number three, and then comes reading in that order. And that he had had made up. It was handwritten by Srila Prabhupada. And he had that made up when Jadarani had come to visit. And she was chanting and chanting and chanting, and hadn't been taking care of her health and working really, really hard. And Srila Prabhupada made a point, and he handwrit, handwrote, he handwrote exactly what importance, in what order of importance we were to take life seriously, because we were so young and so foolish, and we didn't know anything except what Srila Prabhupada taught us. I was involved in the first Tulsi planting and distributing Tulsi, and once we got all the Tulsis, you know, being sent out to all of the temples, I started to ask about kusha grass, because I'd been hearing in the scriptures and I was really interested in plants. Um, before I was a devotee, I was a gardener. And I'd fertilized the, um, the mango trees at the temple, and they gave fruit for the first time in 10 years. So they knew I was really into gardening and everything like that. And I was really interested in kusha grass. So it was so amazing when my name came in, Kusha Devi Dasi. It was, the it was like a big miracle for me because Srila Prabhupada was in India at the time, and how could he know where my head was at? How could he know? Who could have told him? And so I really felt the confirmation that Srila Prabhupada knew what was going on in our minds at all times. He knew where our consciousness was. My name was Dana, so I was expecting some kind of a Dina, some kind of a name with D, because that's usually how it was, that if whatever your name began with, your devotee name began with that letter. And I also had all these desires. I wanted it to be simple and short. You know, I had all these conditions about the way I wanted my name to sound. I didn't want it to sound odd to the Western ear. And there I came with this beautiful, sweet, little short name, Kusha. And it was just like Srila Prabhupada knew all the different little conditions of my mind and he had handwritten my Carmi name on a piece of paper and it was stapled to the beads and the beads were in a thread box sent from India and I was just so mystified by every little thing, all the little details of everything and how he answered my letter so sweetly and it was, it was just such, such a wonderful experience, you know, such a faith enlivening ex experience. There was one incident that I remember because we had had non-Brahmins doing the worship and Gorsinder, because Srila Prabhupada, his health had been fragile, he hadn't wanted to tax Srila Prabhupada with making, asking for more initiations. So there were only a few Brahmins in the temple and we ladies had been doing the Artics and whatnot, Tiridas did Mongol Artic, um, and here we were at a situation where we realized we don't have the Brahmins. And so we phoned to, to Waimanalo to ask Srila Prabhupada if it was okay if um, first initiates did the Arctic. I was a first initiate and Srila Prabhupada yelled, no, they must be Brahmin. I could, we could hear through the phone. When your spiritual master yells, you take it very seriously. <laughs> it, you don't forget it. That's one of the beautiful things. When you hear the spiritual master yell, it's, in, it's ingrained. It's like it's engraved in your heart. And it becomes a sweet thing eventually. And it becomes wonderful because you never forget it. Some of the other things you might forget. Like at the time, we were also making sprouts for Srila Prabhupada. And he said, make sure you get each and every sprout. Don't leave any one of them out. There's a spirit soul in every single one of them. So we took that very seriously. Each, I mean, it was just amazing how merciful Srila Prabhupada was to even a sprout, a little sprout, making sure that they all get equal opportunity to get offered to the Lord. How compassionate it is, our guru. He's that compassionate.
Bhagaji was telling all these beautiful stories and telling about bedding with Srila Prabhupada. And um, he was telling us about the how Vrindavan was so special. And he said, the fish in the Jamuna River, they'll be swimming along, and as soon as they feel like they're getting close to the Ganga, they turn around and swim back towards the Jamuna. And he said, if you take, and Srila Prabhupada's right there listening to everything, and so we knew if Srila Prabhupada said, no, that's not true, or he didn't say anything, it was like, these are real, these are real pastimes. And the interchange between them, to see the friendly interchange was just really lovely because we had only seen Srila Prabhupada in settings with his disciples where he was like a lion on the Vyasasan preaching to his disciples. But now he was in this completely different mood, relaxed with a friend. It was really sweet. And uh, Bhagaji told us that each grain of sand, if you look under an atomic micros microscope, it would say, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. And he said, if you looked at the bones of the, the Vaishnavas, if you actually analyzed them, every microbe, every atom, every cell in there would say, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. That the entire atmosphere of Raj was surcharged with the holy name of the Lord. I had a personal question with Srila Prabhupada regarding my situation um, later on with, because my husband had taken um, a second wife. And at, there was a social experiment at the time with co-wifery or there, there was some interest in it. And my, my first husband, um, he took a second wife and I didn't really understand how I was supposed to act in regard to the situation. It was confusing to me and I had no social reference for it. I had no example to follow. So I asked, um, I was talking to um, Jayatirtha Prabhu and he was traveling with Srila Prabhupada and he said he insisted that I write and speak with Srila Prabhupada about my concerns. And so he hand delivered my letter. It was for me to be able to speak my concerns, I was unable to. You know, I, I needed to write it. I was too shy and, um, and too much uh, in awe of Srila Prabhupada. Srila Prabhupada wrote back a letter, and I was really surprised because I was expecting some kind of etiquette instruction of how to act because of needing instruction on the matter. And Srila Prabhupada, he gave very almost just like the instruction that he gave for everything he said as far as you're concerned he said our instructions are it's not about marriage that's not what it's about he said that I have given all of my disciples instructions on how to advance in Krishna consciousness and if they can't follow then what can I do he said but as far as you're concerned associate with devotees and increase your hearing and chanting so <laughs> it was like I thought he was going to tell me how I should function in this situation and he advised me to not associate with my husband in this letter. He said, just don't associate with him. And that was surprising to me because I was a young girl with a child and I, I you know, my parents are still married. So I, I didn't really believe in divorce. Srila Prabhupada never said the word divorce, ever, not once. He just said, don't associate with your husband. So I took it to heart and I, I separated myself from the situation uh, geographically, not emotionally, because I wasn't really you know, qualified. I was attached to the concept of marriage. You know, that was the thing. But to follow in Srila Prabhupada's instructions, just it, any way I could, even if it wasn't completely from the pure devotional platform that I needed to do that. My son was just two weeks old and we, we did go on a morning walk. It, this was in um, the very end of 73 and he was bundled in a big blanket because it was December and he was two weeks old. And so Srila Prabhupada said to me when on the walk, he, he saw the bundle and he said, can he walk? And I said, no, Srila Prabhupada. And he said, if he can walk, 
he should walk. And I never understood how prophetic that and deep and, and difficult that instruction would be for me because I have a tendency to spoil my loved ones. Srila Prabhupada obviously knew that because it's been an instruction that I've had a really hard time following. And 25, 30 years later, I understand the intensity and the import of that instruction and how Srila Prabhupada predicted my problems. <laughs> it was really amazing, really amazing. The first day I oversalted, and the next morning while Srila Prabhupada was giving class, I got to be used as an example on how over endeavor, Srila Prabhupada said, is just like over salting the food. Oh my goodness, I cringed. It was like I shrunk down. And the word came down no salt. No salt. Srila Prabhupada said, you make everything just like you're making, but no salt. He said, I will add. <laughs> I know how to add just the right amount for you. No salt. Oh my goodness, I thought I would just die. I thought I would just die. And then in class the next morning, I became small, very, very, very small. But it, and there was another part of me that was sort of overjoyed because then I could understand what over endeavor was like. I never really understood what that was because I was so enthusiastic and fairly fanatic. And, you know, we were all pretty fanatic at that point. But Srila Prabhupada was trying to make a point here and he made it so well by using, and anything that would happen during the day became food for instruction for us and he would utilize that to instruct everyone so even though it was really painful and very difficult to take at this point in time I feel very overjoyed that and, and it is something I will never ever forget but Srila Prabhupada how he saved in, the, in, in this particular instance was Rameshwar Maharaj he saw that we had this first class coupe right next to Srila Prabhupada and he saw there were so many sannyasis, important, very important devotees there and who are we? Just two women and a child. And so he was saying, we think that their space would be better occupied by some of these more important devotees. Two women and a child, how important are they? And Srila Prabhupada said, no, how will they how will they? They will be stranded. There will be no way they can get out. It won't be right. We, will, we came with them and we are leaving with them. We were so grateful. We were so grateful. And, so, and also, uh, this nice, this, this Mr. Gupta, the train master, we were, he saw we were cooking for ourselves, so he would have cow's milk brought in. He, you know, he, he had facil, you know, things brought special for Srila Prabhupada. And he made sure we got some of that, too, because he saw that we were cooking for ourselves. And that was all Srila Prabhupada's arrangement. It was all Srila Prabhupada's mercy. There was this amazing incident that took place on the beach at Jagannath Puri. Srila Prabhupada had been extended an uh, invitation to come. There was a book dedication event that was taking place, and there was big pandal put up, and there was a very dark-skinned sort of moti or, you know, large Brahmin fellow who had written a book. And Srila Prabhupada, what had just happened was because Govindadasi w tried to go in and see the deities and it, w it erupted into such a dreadful mishap, she, she had this concept that she was going to pretend she was an old lady and she had a... Um, cane and she had a big chatter. She was accustomed to wearing big chatters all the time to keep warm because she was always cold. So as it was evening, the, in the evening arctic, she tried to go into the temple with this cane, walking in with the cane. She had very big shoulders though, so, you know, and she was all covered up, but they spotted her and they ripped the chatter off and they grabbed her cane and started beating her with the cane and she came running out I was out waiting for her. I didn't feel that brave. Um, 
I was always happy to see Patita Pavana at the steps, and I was thinking of the mood of, of Haridas Thakur and how, who was I to, um, to go in to see the deity. And as soon as this happened, we rushed to see Srila Prabhupada. I mean, she was really, really upset. It really, um, you know, it really, really upset her. And so we both went and f done devats to Srila Prabhupada, and she's explaining in great emotion how I've just been beaten by the, by the chokidars at the, at the temple, and I can't believe this has happened, Srila Prabhupada. And he's, acha, his eyebrows went up. Oh, he was really, really disturbed, really upset about it. You know, he was visibly moved. He was visibly moved at our at Govindadasi's plight. And I was just quietly just taking it all in, just seeing the sweetness of their relationship, just so sweet, like a father concerned for his daughter. And she was so emotional about it. But it wasn't over. Srila Prabhupada wasn't finished. I mean, he, this, he saw this was a problem. It had become extremely apparent there was a problem here. So the next day when Srila Prabhupada accepted this invitation to this book dedication, when he arrived, he arrived with sannyasis, a great entourage of devotees that flanked him, and we came in, it was like this beautiful entourage following Srila Prabhupada as he floated in. And the, the Panda, who was, like I said, he was um, a thicker, dark fellow, he handed the book to Srila Prabhupada. And Srila Prabhupada accepted the book, and he put it to his head, and he said, I have not read it, and handed it back to the Panda. And he immediately began to launch in to this incredibly merciful you know, um, monologue to them. He said, Jagannath is Jagannath. He is not Arisanath. He is not Purinath. His devotees will be coming to visit Jagannath from all over the world. Why you're not letting in his devotees? Why you're not allowing his devotees who are coming from all over this world why are you not allowing them to come and get darshan? This is not good. He said, this is not good. They must be allowed to come in and get darshan of their Lord. He said, if you do not let them in, Lord Jagannath will pack his bags and he will come to live with us. The one thing about Srila Prabhupada, he was really kind to the children, incredibly kind to the children. Um, on another subsequent journey, Srila, I had my son, and he, by the time he could walk, he was wearing the little slip-on dhotis, and he had these cute little outfits, and he would just chant and dance so nicely for Srila Prabhupada, and three times Srila Prabhupada said that he was a dancer in a previous life, he said he was a great devotee, a big devotee, but three times he mentioned about dancing, and three times he mentioned about his big devotion. And they had this incredible rasa between the two of them. Every day, Atmarama would give him a garland, and every single day, Srila Prabhupada would take one of his garlands off and garland him. It was just so beautiful. And one thing that really I remember with great joy, because every service that I ever did, I think the, the service that was the most satisfying to me was seeing the pleasure that Srila Prabhupada took in our children his second generation. I mean, it was just magnificent. I felt, as a mother, extremely satisfied to see this reciprocation. And Srila Prabhupada, he was, as, as he was get, taking Charnamrita and paying obeisances, he sprinkled his wash water on my son's head. And at that moment, my entire life, there, it was the success of my existence. And, and the sunam bonum of any service that I might ever have performed to my spiritual master. These children are so important, and Srila Prabhupada made it very clear, very clear how important this child seva was, and still is. It's glorious. <laughs> Thank you.